So what I'm going to be talking to you about today is uh, opting out of Medicare. And uh, we're going to start by considering what you already know, which are all the reasons physicians opt out of Medicare. And I'm not going to be providing all the uh, numbers and whatnot because you know those and all, all the uh, other things. What I've sort of opted for today is kind of a, a pictorial uh, summary. And uh, Medicare, uh, basically, they obstruct, impede, and interfere with nearly every aspect of the practice of medicine today. Is this how some of you feel sometimes in your exam room? Medicare is right in there. They have their tentacles all over everything. Or maybe this is how some of you feel. You let the 2,000 pound gorilla into your exam room to stand between you and your patients. Meanwhile, they're holding that government piggy bank, looking at cost containment at the expense of the patient. Or maybe this is how you feel. Medicare has kind of prov uh, provided you with a new kind of white coat that basically ties you up and restricts you in nearly everything that you do. And then, as we just heard, there's the risk of prosecution, prison time, and ruinous fines. If you are not uh, very, very careful in the way that you submit every claim to Medicare, if you get one of those digits out of the five-digit codes wrong, or you inadvertently use the wrong CPT codes or other issues like that, uh, you can end up like this. And as you heard it described, uh, it can even include uh, if the government does not agree with the way that you described the surgery that you performed in an operative report. If they don't agree with that, you can end up in prison. And the old Soviet KGB slogan was, show me the man and I'll show you his crime. And that's basically where we are in the Medicare system today, is that there are so many laws, rules, and regulations that they can pick any one of you out at any time and find something that you're violating. Now, the economic aspects of Medicare, all of you know. Every year, doctors face their own personal fiscal cliff. Every year, there's a 25 to 30 percent cut in fees that's uh, on the table, and uh, physicians hope for that last-minute doc fix, which has happened every year except 2002. In 2002, if you recall, the, doc, the uh, Medicare cut of 4.8 percent did go into effect. And also, uh, you might recall that the financing of Obamacare partially depends on physicians taking about a 25 to 30 percent fee cut at some point in order to fund it. And then there's all the little cuts, you know, death by a thousand cuts. There's the sequestration cut. Well, it's only 2 percent every year, but it's in effect over 10 years. So what does that do to your fees over 10 years? Well, let's see, let's do the math. 2 percent times 10 years, that's a 20 percent cut in fees just based on the sequestration cuts. And as we'll see a little later, there are a lot of other little cuts that are sort of non-compliance cuts that occur uh, if, if you don't comply with certain things. So in terms of the economic aspects of Medicare, do some of you feel like this sometimes? You're running harder and faster just to keep in the same place. Or maybe some of you feel a little like this in your offices, sitting in the uh, restraining cage pushing that little lever as hard and as fast as you can, hoping to earn enough money to cover your office overhead and malpractice expense to meet payroll, and oh, by the way, maybe have a little left over by way of making a living. Or maybe some of you are spending far too much time practicing bureaucracy and fighting the Medicare bureaucracy instead of practicing medicine. How many went into medicine figuring that they would like to spend most of their time practicing bureaucracy. Not too many. But it always seems that they, they have more and more hoops for you to jump through each and every year. There are more of them. And you spend more and more of your time just doing nothing but fighting the Medicare bureaucracy for relatively low fixed fees. Prior to opting out of Medicare in 2004, I was spending approximately 40 to 50 percent of my professional time doing nothing but fighting the Medicare bureaucracy. And this was all over errors that they made. 
I didn't make the errors. These, these were errors that Medicare made or uh, improper interpretations of regulations, their own Medicare regulations. And sometimes this was for really stupid stuff. In one case, Medicare declared one of my patients dead. And they argued with me for nearly a year, insisting she was dead. And it didn't matter that this woman went down to the local Social Security office and showed her picture ID and said, look, I'm still breathing. That was not persuasive for these arrogant and abusive CMS Medicare bureaucrats. Eventually, I ended up writing about 20 letters uh, trying to convince them that the woman was still alive. She was concerned, of course, they would cut off her Social Security checks because they don't, they're not supposed to give those to dead people. And of course, they didn't want to pay for medical care because they're not supposed to pay for medical care for dead people. So eventually, it took basically an act of Congress. I got a local congressman involved who uh, went to bat for this uh, patient. And eventually, the uh, arrogant uh, Medicare bureaucrats decided, yes, they should resurrect the woman. But they refused to give her her name back and the Medicare number that went with the name. They said, this has been flagged in our system, our main computer database in Baltimore, and we just we can't do that. So they actually renamed the woman. They named her after a name brand, Enema. And they gave her a new Medicare number to go with that. And it took another intervention by the congressman to get them to give this poor woman her name back again, although I think they issued her a new Medicare number. So that's how uh, crazy and abusive it can become. You might be wondering what these boxes are. These boxes are the collection of correspondence it took for me, to, uh, between me and the Medicare bureaucrats, to try and get the problems that they created corrected. And this uh, collection of correspondence between me and the Medicare bureaucracy stands a little over eight feet high, and it weighs over 200 pounds. I even named it Little Frank, which is short for Little Frankenstein, because it was a government-created monster that was literally eating me out of house and home. So that's what it really looks like. And by the way, they don't consider any of this when they tout the low administrative costs of Medicare. You remember how they're always saying, oh, look, Medicare, it's low administrative costs. None of this, none of the cost of producing this, which was required to correct errors that they made, none of this counts in that cost estimate. So uh, CMS Medicare is a, me is a bureaucracy that is based on incompetence. It's, uh, it's proven. 96% of the time, believe it or not, 96% of the time, Medicare customer service representatives provide the wrong answer to questions as to how to properly bill Medicare. And this was published as an editorial in our journal back in 2004, if you would like to read it. It's actually based on a government accountability uh, office study. That is, the investigative arm of Congress actually did the study. It was uh, an open book test. The, CMA, the Medicare bureaucrats knew what the questions would be ahead of time. And they got to comment if, there were, if the questions were too hard, they would be excluded. And even so, 96% of the time when these uh, uh, people from the GAO called up and said, treat us like we're a doctor. We have this billing question. How do we bill Medicare properly? 96% of the time, they provided the wrong answer. Now, I did the definitive experiment uh, in this, which was also published in that editorial back in 2004. And this little guy is a lot smarter than he looks. And what I did was I uh, rephrased the Medicare questions so that the toad could answer them by jumping to the left for yes and jumping to the right for no. And it turns out this smart little toad got it right 50% of the time. That's 46% better than the performance of Medicare bureaucrats. And then there's the physician satisfaction factor. Being forced to practice bureaucracy instead of medicine isn't fun. Stifling of innovation and focusing on the requirements of the Medicare system instead of focusing on the needs of the patient. Our most miraculous advances in medicine come about through individual initiative, which has always been possible under the American system of the practice of medicine, where men like the Mayos and the Cryles may develop great medical centers and become the recognized leaders of the world. These things were possible because the physicians of the past 
have not been hampered or molested by government regulation or dictatorship, which wiped out their enthusiasm or took away their feeling of responsibility for the health and well-being of their individual patients. These are the comments of the first president of AAPS, Dr. J. Robert Doty, back in August of 1944, which was the first AAPS meeting. If you would like to read a little more about the foundation of AAPS and the history of AAPS, I would refer you to this uh, excellent uh, article we published in the first issue of our journal called Fighting to Preserve uh, Private Medicine, the Role of AAPS. And uh, some of the authors uh, are even here today, Dr. Dan Jordan, walking in the back of the room there, and uh, Dr. Jane Orient, who's our uh, executive uh, director. And so we have actually some uh, living history uh, resources uh, here today. And if you want to ask Dr. Jordan about the San Joaquin Foundation for Medical Care, which was an attempt to control medical care, in the hospitals and through county medical societies and contro control individual uh, physician practices and how the Council of Medical Staffs, which was headed by one of the AAPS uh, members, exposed what was going on, uh, feel free to ask him. We have quite a few resources right here today. And then there's ethical factors, that is being forced to act as agents of rationing for Medicare and Medicare destroying patient-physician relationships. This was an editorial published in the Medical Sentinel, which was the journal, uh, the forerunner of our current journal. It's entitled, Medicare Destroying Patient-Doctor Trust, and it describes how these Medicare bureaucrats destroyed about 100 of my patient-doctor relationships. And I'm not unique. Uh, they do this all the time uh, for many physicians. We also have some other comments from AAPS presidents from the past. At the present time, doctors have a choice. It is between collaboration or refusal to participate. Since it is legal, ethical, and moral for doctors to refuse to participate in this Medicare program, which will eventually hurt every man, woman, and child in this land for longer than any of us care to foresee, and since Congressman Mills plotted our course when he stated that the program cannot succeed without the willing, intelligent cooperation of the doctors, this doctor takes his stand alongside of his patients and his nation. I say for myself only, I will continue to care for my patients on the same basis and in the same conscientious manner that I've cared for them for over 30 years. I will not participate in this unholy political scheme to increase government control over all of us. And again, these are comments of our past AAPS presidents, Dr. E.E. E. Anthony and Dr. Thomas L. Dwyer from 1965. And again, a lot of this is covered in that same uh, excellent uh, article in our journal. So to summarize the reasons for opting out of uh, Medicare, some days it's just enough to make you want to scream, isn't it? So the solution, of course, is kick the 2,000-pound gorilla out of your exam room. And uh, this is becoming an increasingly popular choice because between 2009 and 2012, the number of physicians who opted out of Medicare tripled. In 2012, which is the uh, latest year that we have numbers for, 9,539 physicians opted out of Medicare. And we even have a breakdown as far as some of the specialties. The two specialties with the highest opt-out percentages were psychiatrists at 1.1%. 1% opted out, plastic and reconstructive surgeons at 1.56% opted out, and primary care physicians at 0.35% opted out. Now there are some that will find that it is easier for some specialties than others to uh, opt out of uh, Medicare, but it is, uh, it is possible. So the factors to consider in making the opt-out decision, well, there's financial and non-financial considerations. The financial considerations are that you need to consider the revenue, the total revenue equation. That is gross revenue minus expenses equals net revenue. And you'll find, I think, that once you get rid of the huge administrative costs of sending claims to Medicare, filing appeals and whatnot, that the net re revenue uh, may actually increase. 
Number two, you need to look at the type of services you provide uh, and the patient population and make some assessment about the ability to collect directly from your patients. And if you elect to stay in Medicare, you need to consider the cost of you and your staff, for example, keeping up with the ever-changing Medicare rules and regulations and the cost of filing and handling Medicare claims and appeals and the cost of compliance. If you decide to opt out, it might also be helpful to find some type of a niche service, if possible, and you need to think about how to develop a marketing campaign to inform your patients of the benefits of seeing an opted out physician. And one of the benefits is uh, that you get to spend more time with the patients. The average amount of time now that some doctors spend with their patients is about eight minutes. And that's hardly enough time to say hi and then goodbye. And the patients uh, actually don't like this bum's rush or being treated like cattle through the cattle chute. They actually like spending more face-to-face -face time with their physician, and that's something that you can provide as an opted-out physician. And again, you need to consider the cost of non-compliance. Uh, if you're not compliant with this new ICD-10, for example, you will experience a 100% cut in fee because they will not process your Medicare claim. There's also e-prescribing. If you're non-compliant with e-prescribing, you'll have a 2% cut in uh, 2014. If you're not compliant with meaningful use, uh, you will experience a 1% cut in 2015, 2% in 2016, 3% in 2017, 4% in 2018, and 5% in 2019 and beyond. And then there's the physician quality reporting system. If you're not compliant with PQRS, the fees will be cut by 1.5% in 2015 and 2% in 2016 and beyond. So you can begin to see how these uh, cumulative cuts really add up. And that's, of course, in addition to the sequestration cut of 20% over 10 years. Then, of course, there's this horrible maintenance of certification uh, thing. And there will be a penalty for not participating in MOC beginning in 2016. You will experience uh, fee cuts. Then there's the non-financial considerations, which uh, for many may be more important. It's the freedom and pleasure of actually being able to practice medicine again instead of having to practice bureaucracy or having to act as an agent of rationing for the government. It's a positive patient experience and it allows you to protect patient privacy better. There's also no fear of ruinous fines or prison time for inadvertent coding errors or running afoul of some obtuse Medicare law, rule, or regulation, or ending up like Dr. John Natale in prison simply because the government disagreed with the way he described his operation in his operative report. And remember that there are bounty hunters out there, private bounty hunters known as RACs, recovery audit contractors, who get a percentage of the cut uh, for whatever they deem that you uh, overcharged or were improperly paid. There's also ZPIX, Zone Program Integrity Contractors, uh, which tend to be a more malignant bunch because they tend to go for criminal prosecutions. Another benefit is simplification. Opt-out physicians need not use any codes in serving their Medica uh, Medicare patients, so no more CPT, ICD-9, or ICD-10 codes and no more constant Medicare hassles. So you have more time to actually spend with your patients and, wow, more time to spend with your family as well. So basically, it's uh, experiencing the joy of uh, practicing medicine again. The procedure for opting out of Medicare is uh, actually uh, pretty simple. Uh, you can go to the AAPS uh, website and download some of this. We also have in your packet, we've already downloaded some of it. You'll find in the, uh, in the brochure entitled Toolkit, You'll find a section called How to Opt Out of Medicare, and it's got all the, uh, all the forms there that you need to be able to opt out of Medicare and provide private contracts to your patients. You'll find something else in your uh, packet entitled Sample Medicare Opt-Out Forms, and this also has some sample letters that you can use with your patients to tell them why you're opting out of the Medicare program. So the procedure for opting out is different for non-participating physicians than it is for participating physicians. And again, participating physicians are the ones who sign an agreement to accept a payment in full, to accept as payment in full the payment that Medicare sends to them. So it's an assignment basis on all patients, whereas non-participating physicians 
uh, can elect to accept assignment on a case-by-case -case basis. So non-participating physicians can opt out of Medicare any time during the year. A copy of the opt-out uh, affidavit must be provided to the Medicare carrier no later than 10 days after the first contract to which the affidavit applies. And uh, I would highly recommend, however, that you provide the affidavit well in advance of the planned start of the opt-out period and not wait to do it 10 days after you've filed the first private uh, contract. And, and again, that's due to the Medicare bungling factor. Remember who you're dealing with. These people get it wrong 96% of the time. There's also a 90-day grace period after the filing of the first affidavit during which the physician can withdraw the opt-out affidavit. So if it's not working, you've got 90 days, and that's only with the first affidavit, not with any renewal. And the other thing is you need to be sure to check other contracts and affiliations you may have, which may require participation in Medicare before you opt out. Participating physicians, on the other hand, can only opt out four times during the year. And the Medicare contractor must receive the opt-out affidavit one month before the beginning of each quarter. And again, it pays to start well in advance. The deadlines for carriers receiving opt-out affidavits are March 1st, June 1st, September 1st, and December 1st. And remember that you have to file the affidavit with all of the Medicare contractors with which you do business. And remember that the opt-out is good for only two years. It's not a divorce where it's a permanent type thing. You have to re-divorce yourself from the Medicare program every two years. So that's something you want to put on your calendar to make sure that you don't miss that deadline. There's also a, a provision whereby when you're opted out, you're not really opted out in all circumstances. That is, you're not allowed to make new private contracts with patients in an emergency or urgent situation. In those situations, you basically revert to a non-participating physician status and are treated like a non-participating physician, meaning that you can accept assignment or not accept assignment on the patient for that care. Uh, but again, there's balance billing limits that apply and you can't simply balance bill the patient anything that you want to. As far as the early termination of the opt-out, remember this is the 90-day period following the first opt-out. You must not have previously opted out of Medicare, so it only applies to the first one. You must notify all Medicare carriers of the termination of the opt-out no later than 90 days after the effective date of the opt-out. And you must refund to each beneficiary with whom practitioner has privately contracted all payment collected in excess of the Medicare limiting charge, so that could be a real hassle. Uh, must notify all beneficiaries with whom the physician entered into private contracts of the termination of opt-out and beneficiaries' rights to have claims filed on their behalf for services provided during the opt-out period. And the physician is then reinstated to his prior Medicare status as if there had been no opt-out. So uh, yes, you're allowed out of it within 90 days the first time, uh, and it might be a little difficult because you may have to file claims on all those patients and uh, make refunds for anything collected above the Medicare limiting charge. And again, you can download the step-by-step -step instructions for opting out of uh, Medicare, the opt-out affidavit, and everything else you need, including the sample letters uh, for patients that you can customize for your own practice. Again, a lot of those are in your packet today. And you can also find on the APS website a list of physicians by state who have opted out. And of course, videos and talks given by opt-out physicians about their experience and tips for success. And a list of physicians in various specialties who are willing to serve as mentors and answer specific questions regarding the opt-out experience in their particular specialty. And of course, AAPS offers these uh, Thrive Not Just Survive workshops a couple of times per year in different locations, which is what you're attending uh, today. Tips for opting out, start at least six months in advance of beginning the opt-out period. This provides time for you to inform the patients of the changes, why the changes are being made, and it also allows you to have time to sort of get your staff adjusted to the situation so that they don't inadvertently submit uh, Medicare claims. I would highly recommend that you send a cover letter, certified mail return receipt to the Medicare carrier with the opt-out affidavit requesting written acknowledgement that the opt-out has been properly accomplished. Again, these are bungling, incompetent bureaucrats. And just because you send the affidavit in and everything's proper doesn't mean that it got processed. So you want some 
specifics in writing that say, yes, we got it. You did it properly and it's in effect. Also, as I mentioned, you need to mark your calendar so you don't forget to renew it every two years and you need to make sure office procedures are in place so that your office does not file uh, Medicare claims inadvertently. Neither the patient nor the physician can file Medicare claims when you're opted out. And again, if you have any specific questions about opting out of Medicare or transitioning to a third-party free practice, feel free to call us at uh, AAPS, and I thank you for your attention.